In the calm, dark hours of the night on Saturday, the 13th of April, 2024, air raid sirens sounded off across Israel. Around the world, alerts chimed and cell phones flared to life, alerting any person with even the most basic access to modern media that an attack was coming. Dozens of drones had lifted off from Iran and were on their way on a long, slow march across the Middle East with Israel directly in the crosshairs. For people just tuning in, the attack was both perplexing and deeply worrying, launched by a far stronger and more fearsome adversary than the Hamas organization Israel was supposed to be fighting in Gaza. For those who've watched this conflict closely, it was the moment we'd all been dreading for months, the moment the posturing, rhetoric, proxy warfare, and even direct attacks on each other in third nations boiled over into an attack that could become the opening salvo in a new international war. Israel on one side, Iran on the other. On today's special episode of War of Graphics, we're going to take a close and comprehensive look at Iran's strike on Israel, what happened, why it happened, what's been going on below the surface of Middle Eastern affairs, and what comes next. The attack. Iran's assault on Israel commenced on the evening of Saturday, April 13th, local time, with the launch of roughly 170 drones from Iranian airspace. The drones were a widely used Iranian designed model called the Shahed 136, suicide drones that attack in waves against ground targets. Each drone is equipped with up to 50 kilograms, that's 110 pounds of explosives, intended to crash directly into a target and detonate in the process. Cruising at a top speed of just 185 kilometers per hour or so, not much faster than 100 miles an hour, they would take several hours to get all the way to Israel. The Israeli Defense Forces, or IDF, sounded the alarm, and not only Israel, but several surrounding nations either closed down their airspace at that time or had already done so in anticipation of the attack. As the drones closed in, Iran launched a second wave attack, over 30 cruise missiles which fly in a relatively straight shot over long distances, and over 120 ballistic missiles which climb high into the atmosphere before falling downward toward their targets. Both ballistic and cruise missiles fly far faster than the Shahed drones, and Iran had timed its launch to bring those missiles crashing down on Israel slightly after the arrival of the drones. It's a tactic that's rapidly rising in popularity among 21st century warfighters, and one that the Institute for the Study of War has since claimed to be a near carbon copy of tactics that Russia has used against Ukraine in its ongoing war. The incoming drones and cruise missiles are meant to occupy an enemy's air defense systems, costing them valuable interceptor rockets that take time to reload, while the faster, harder to hit, and deadlier ballistic missiles arrive during a critical moment of vulnerability, surging through and hitting the intended targets. Said the Institute in their analysis, quoting, The Iranians very likely expected that few if any of the cruise missiles would hit their targets, but likely hoped that a significantly higher percentage of the ballistic missiles would do so. Also worth noting, Iran allied groups from Hezbollah in Lebanon to the Houthis in Yemen to militias in Iraq all launched their own rockets at Israel, according to IDF spokesperson Daniel Hagari. When the combined attack came within range, Israeli air defenses roared to life. Standing against the missiles and drones was Israel's vaunted multi layer defensive shield, a highly advanced interlocking system of long, medium, and short range systems meant to bring down a wide array of aerial threats in and around Israeli airspace. At long range, Israel's Arrow 2 and Arrow 3 systems used detachable warheads to intercept Iran's ballistic missiles, doing it at altitudes that ensure that even if a nuclear warhead was mounted to one of the missiles, it would have been disposed of at altitudes far enough from the Earth's surface to render its effect harmless. In medium range, Israel used David's Sling, a system that can launch intercepting missiles against all of the munitions Iran used at a range of 100 to 200 kilometers, that's 62 to 124 miles. The drones and missiles that made it through Arrow and David's Sling had to face down the Iron Dome, Israel's globally exalted last line of aerial defense, which fires missiles to dispose of short range threats in midair. Also, at Israel's disposal were American made Patriot air defense systems and the aircraft of the Israeli Air Force, including over 200 F 15 and F 16 fighters and dozens of advanced F 35s. A final element of Israel's defense, the so-called Iron Beam Laser Defense System, has not yet gone operational and thus wasn't used in this case. Israel's allies took part in the defense too. The US, the UK, France, and Jordan each took down numerous incoming targets using warplanes and air defenses, while the French Navy provided radar coverage for the affected area. Against such a comprehensive air defense, Israel's assault was largely unsuccessful. Of the 200 or so Shahed drones and cruise missiles, not a single one is believed to have impacted their intended targets inside Israel. And of Iran's ballistic missiles, just a small handful were claimed as successful hits by Iran. According to Iran itself, the intended targets were Israel's Nevatim Air Base and an intelligence center in a mountain cluster called Mount Hermon, as well as the Ramon Air Base in Israel's south. 
We'll speak at length about why those targets were chosen, but for now, suffice it to say that Iran scored very few hits. According to Israel, five Iranian ballistic missiles struck the Nebatim airbase and four hit the Ramon airbase, but the extent of the damage was limited to a hit on a parked C-130 transport aircraft, a runway that hasn't been in use, a few empty storage hangars and scattered locations around the airbases, oh, where not much was happening. Iran has claimed far more substantial damage, but as of yet, no evidence of that damage has been made public. There were no deaths due to the attack in Israel or anywhere else, although several people sustained minor injuries from shrapnel and a seven-year-old Bedouin girl in Israel was seriously injured. In the early hours following the attack, the relatively limited destruction led many news outlets to conclude that the attack had been meant for show, making brazen flyovers of third nations but choosing points of impact where not many people would be put at risk. Critically, though, most international experts have now concluded that this particular attack was not meant to be a simple expression of token retribution. There was real potential for a less dangerous strike, one that Iranian leaders could show their people to say, see, we're doing something, while crafting the strike in a way that would let Israel repel it easily, thus signaling that Iran didn't want to take this matter any further. It's not an uncommon feature of global flashpoints to see all that sort of attack in order to pacify hardliners at home and defuse tensions abroad at the same time. But the tactics Iran chose, the weapons it relied on, and the sheer scale of the attack all indicate that this was real. Although Iran shows slow-flying, easy-to-spot Shahed drones for its attack, the addition of large numbers of ballistic missiles indicate that Iran telegraphed its attack not to allow Israel a chance to repel it, but to soak up Israeli air defense capability and allow at least some missiles to get through. The attack wasn't meant to do massive or disproportionate amounts of damage, but it was meant to work. And it didn't. The Context and Reactions when discussing the context for Iran's strike, we're going to work our way backward across the timeline, where first, we've got to talk about the Israeli attack that directly preceded it. On the 1st of April this year, Israel launched an airstrike against an Iranian consulate building in Damascus, Syria, that was part of a larger compound that also housed the Iranian embassy there. The consulate that was struck included the living quarters of Iran's ambassador to Syria, but that was only collateral damage. The real target of the strike was a meeting happening inside the consulate building between several members of non-state militias allied with Iran and seven members of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, or IRGC. Among their number was Brigadier General Mohammad Reza Zahedi, alongside his deputy, Brigadier General Mohammad Hadi Haji Rahimi. All seven RGC soldiers were killed, alongside seven other associates, military organizations that Israel considers its enemies, and two civilians. The attack was a major blow to Iran, not just because it directly targeted an Iranian diplomatic target in a third nation, and thus flagrantly broke one of the few rules of the international order that most of the world actually sticks to. Even more important were the deaths of Brigadier General Zahedi and Rahimi, two senior commanders of Iran's Quds Force. The Quds Force is Iran's premier special operations, military intelligence, and unconventional warfare branch, and they prop up a range of Iran-allied organizations around the world, from Hamas in Gaza to the Houthi rebels in Yemen to Hezbollah in Lebanon on and more. Zahedi and Rahimi are the most senior Revolutionary Guard Corps members to be killed since America's 2020 assassination of Quds Force leader Qasim Soleimani, a strike that's had ripple effects that many international observers have cited as directly leading to Israel's current war against Hamas. Since Israel's strike, it's been no secret that an Iranian retaliation was going to hit sooner than later. Iran publicly vowed revenge after the strike, and Israel-allied nations around the world, including the United States, took care to express to Iran and the global public that they hadn't any advance notice of the strike. Western nations applied intense pressure to Iran in order to deter an attack, while Israel threatened direct retribution on Iranian soil if they were made targets of a retaliatory strike. Iran directly cautioned the U.S. against intervening in any way and passed a threat from Iran's Swiss embassy to Americas that U.S. military bases could be attacked in the Middle East if the U.S. takes part in an Israeli defense. That's a sore spot for the U.S. after three American reservists were killed and 34 were wounded in a strike on an American airbase near the Jordan-Syria-Iraq border in January. Regional nations that host American bases also lodged requests that America not use their territory to launch a counterattack in the event that a strike did come. Finally, Iran warns nations of the region three days before the attack, knowing full well that those warnings would eventually make it back to the Americans and the Israelis. So, when we look at the Iranian attack that ultimately did strike Israel, it's hard to miss the retaliatory nature of the attack, and that's intentional by Iran. Although, again, it does appear that Iran meant this attack to be a major success, it's also important to note that it was a direct response to the Israeli strike on that consular building in Damascus. Even the targets Iran chose were ones that had been directly involved. The airbase where Israel's warplanes took off in order to launch the strike and the intelligence station that's believed to have tracked the Quds Force generals. The intent was to make Israel pay, but it wasn't meant to start a war. At least not yet. 
It's the geopolitical equivalent of elbowing back and forth with your sibling in the back of your parents' car. Neither of you really wants to break each other's nose or knock out any teeth right now, but you do mean every bit of those elbows, and you're not about to let them be the one to get the last shot in. But in order to really make sense of this attack, we've got to understand the longer recent history between Iran and Israel. Obviously, the history of religious, ethnic, and geopolitical tensions in the Middle East goes back a very, very long time, and we're not going to dive into that history here. But among the byproducts of that long and troubled history is a shadow war between Iran and Israel that's gone on for decades. On this channel, and our sister channel, Into the Shadows, we've dedicated several episodes to the long-running three-way Cold War in the Middle East between Israel, Iran, and Saudi Arabia. But to give the short version, all three nations have battled economically, diplomatically, and via proxy warfare to build their control and influence over the Middle East as a whole. While Israel tends to fight that Cold War through mostly economic and diplomatic means, relying on its strong relationship with the global West and its immense military strength relative to the rest of the region, Iran has taken a different tone, building what it and its own proxy forces refer to as the Axis of Resistance. That axis is made up of numerous non-state actors that we've mentioned today. Hamas in Gaza, Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Houthi rebels in Yemen, and a network of other militias in Iraq and Syria. The Syrian government also relies heavily on Iran, and the Iraqi government is getting increasingly cozy with Iran as time goes on. Iran provides those groups with financial, military, and intelligence support, primarily relying on its Quds Force, the same organization that the prominent Iranian generals killed in Israel's 1st of April airstrike helped to lead. Introduce that context, and we start to see Iran's attack for what it really was, the clearest indication that this long Cold War is at risk of going hot. Iran has pulled the strings behind attacks on and resistance against Israel for years, and especially since the start of the Israel-Hamas war, Hamas solicits strong, direct support from Iran, while Hezbollah in southern Lebanon has traded near daily fire with Israel since the war kicked off, and the Houthi rebels in Yemen have embarked on a large-scale campaign against global maritime shipping. Israel has fought back, retaliated, and launched a large-scale counteroffensive against Hamas in the wake of its terror attack on October 7, 2023. But even Israel's direct strike on the Quds Force leaders this month at least took place in a third nation and could be interpreted as something other than a direct attack on Iran on its own soil. Now Iran has chosen to shatter the thin veneer of indirect conflict that still existed here. In the aftermath, an accounting of Iran's attempted strike has revealed not only its unprecedented scope, but its major effect in disrupting the international order of the last several decades. Given how many Shahed drones were used, Iran has now blown past the historical record of the biggest drone strike ever, even if it was largely unsuccessful in achieving its tactical aims. Not only that, but it's the first time since 1991, that's 34 years, that Israel has been attacked directly by the military of another global nation. So, with Iran's attack now concluded, it's on Israel to decide what it's going to do next. Here we find three basic options. Israel can draw down the conflict, it can respond proportionally, or it can escalate. Drawing down would involve launching a less severe strike than Iran's in response, say, a limited attack on low-level Quds Force members operating abroad, or no military response at all. According to conventional geopolitical wisdom, that would signal to Iran that Israel would like to take steps toward both nations deciding not to attack anymore. A proportional response would see Israel attempt to craft an attack that basically matches what Iran did, sending the signal that this isn't over, but Israel doesn't intend to go to war over it. An escalation would involve an even larger retaliatory response by Israel, basically telling Iran Iran to knuckle up and get ready for full-scale hostilities. Of course, Iran, Israel, and the entire rest of the world have reason to care what response Israel decides. In the wake of the attack, most of the global response has been focused on both telling Iran how bad an affront to the international order its attack was, and telling Israel just how bad it would be if the situation escalated further. Iran's strike has been strongly condemned by Israel's allies, including the UN, the UK, Canada, Japan, and the nations of Europe. Nations who are generally more open to engaging with Iran have declined to offer any support, with China and Russia both urging restraint, and Turkey and Saudi Arabia exerting pressure on Iran to wrap up its retaliation here instead of carrying it on further. The United Nations, too, has come down hard against Iran, and even direct allies of Tehran have held off on calling for further escalation. But although Israel's allies have remained committed to its national defense, with the U.S. insisting that its commitment to the military defense of the nation is, quote, ironclad, even the U.S. has stressed that its active support of Israel does not include support of further Israeli strikes against Iran. The U.S. has flat out denied that it would participate in an Israeli retaliation, quoting a senior American official who spoke to ABC, we believe Israel has freedom of action to defend itself in Syria or elsewhere. 
That's a long-standing policy, and that remains. But no, we would not envision ourselves participating in such a thing. In private phone calls, US President Joe Biden has reportedly emphasized to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that Israel can claim its successful defense against the Iranian assault as a victory, and that it doesn't stand to gain anything further by continuing to engage in a cycle of escalation. At the time of writing, Israel's decision isn't made yet. As it persecutes a broad counteroffensive in Gaza and works to establish favorable terms for both a possible ceasefire and a possible assault against the city of Rafah, it's under pressure to exercise care with how it selects a response. At the time of writing, Israel has reconvened its war cabinet for two consecutive days to discuss potential responses, indicating that the decision is not yet made on whether or how Israel will act next. With that uncertainty firmly in mind, it's time we swing around to focus on the fundamental question behind today's episode, and the question that's rightly on the minds of world leaders, global analysts, and ordinary people watching this exchange play out around the world. Is the Middle East on the brink of war? The answer? Well, yeah, it would certainly appear that way. As unsatisfying as it is, though, oh, we simply can't issue an ironclad prediction about the future of this conflict yet. After all, Israel doesn't even seem to know what it's going to do yet, and our psycho powers here at War Graphics do not extend so far as to see inside Bibi Netanyahu's head. But at the very least, we have some broad indicators on which way Israel appears to be leaning. And we have the data to extrapolate just what could happen next if Israel decides to either draw hostilities down or ratchet them upward. One pretty good indicator came from Israeli War Cabinet Minister Benny Gantz, a man who's both a longtime political opponent of Prime Minister Netanyahu and a current ally in the political coalition governing Israel's military action in Gaza and abroad. The day after the attack by Iran, Gantz stated that Israel would indeed respond to Iran, quote, in a way and at the time that suits us. Although Gantz is a war hawk in his own right, he's generally perceived to be less inclined to these sorts of major military actions than Netanyahu is, thus implying that if he's on board, the PM probably is too. Israel and Iran have traded barbs at an emergency meeting of the UN Security Council, and they've seemed outwardly to be unmoved by any talk of complete drawdown. At the meeting, Israel's UN ambassador called Iran both, quote, the number one global sponsor of terror, and quoting again, a pirate state, while Iran's ambassador defended his country's actions as a proportional response that it had no choice but to undertake. Israel further claims that it, quote, reserves the right to retaliate. On Iranian state TV, RGC generals have been careful to express that any retaliation to this strike, not just an escalatory response, will prompt a much larger attack from Iran. That is to say, Iran has indicated, in advance, how it intends to interpret an Israeli response, drawing a hard line in the sand that signals that Israel's next move will now decide just how big this thing gets. At the same time, Israel appears to be banking on the idea that at least some of its allies' resistance to a retaliation is just talk. The Israeli government at present appears to be working toward the assembly of a larger regional coalition that would allow it to strike, potentially on a scale that would suggest escalation rather than proportional response. And as for why Israel would be willing to take that chance, the international support given to Israel to defend against this attack has indicated to both Israel and global observers that Israel's partner nations are not willing to leave it isolated in the face of a major threat. For months now, many experts around the world have speculated that Prime Minister Netanyahu's motivations for pursuing such a massive and heavy-handed retaliation against the Hamas organization are at least partly political in nature. Netanyahu is unpopular among the Israeli public, especially at this phase of the war, and he's likely to face political challenges once the war ends. In order to stay in power at all, he's got to both placate partners within Israel's hard right who want an even bigger military response, and work with Israel's larger opposition movement toward a ceasefire and the return of hostages still being kept prisoner by Hamas. The US and other close allies of Israel have put on their own increased pressure recently in the wake of mass casualty incidents killing Gazan civilians, an emerging famine, and the killing of several international aid workers in a recent Israeli drone strike against a humanitarian convoy. But what this latest attack has shown is that Israel's support gets a lot less qualified when it enters into larger hostilities with Iran. The West has rallied behind the Netanyahu government after the Iranian attack in a way that's been rare to see since the start of the Israel-Hamas war. And while it's unlikely that a wider war would see America, the UK, the European Union, Egypt, or Jordan bombing Tehran directly, it's very likely to keep those same nations arrayed on Israel's side of the conflict and thus on Israel's side of the war against Hamas. For a consummate political survivalist like Netanyahu, that would be a massive boon to his future prospects, if indeed his motivations are what global affairs analysts tend to agree they are. 
As for Iran, it's likely that the nation is coming to grips with a miscalculation around just how effective its aerial weapons were going to be. Unlike Russia's use of similar tactics against Ukraine, these hundreds of drones and missiles were not enough to overwhelm Israel's much more robust system of air defenses. And while the involvement of other nations certainly made Israel's job easier, there's no clear indicator that Iran would have even been successful if Israel was defending alone. The majority of Iran's aerial weapons were dealt with outside of Israeli airspace, and those that came closer did relatively little damage even with their shrapnel when measured relative to the size of the attack that Iran launched. It's unknown just how many drones Iran has in its arsenal, but it's just burned nearly 200 of them in this assault, along with almost 100 ballistic missiles. If it's going to launch a more successful attack, it's going to need to devote a hell of a lot more firepower. And then there's the foreign relations angle to consider. After months of posturing, Iran finally presented a situation to the nations of the world that would force them to show where their loyalties lie, and the result, at least broadly, was not in Iran's favor. The participation of nations like Jordan and France in Israel's defense, and the active involvement of the US after it warned about potential retaliation against its own bases by Iran, indicate that Israel would have major military support on its side in the case of larger hostilities. But the idea that it could pose major problems to Israel on Israel's own territory is just rather hard to believe. As for what a potential war between Israel and Iran could look like, well, that could take many forms, but none of them are particularly encouraging to think about. At a bare minimum, both nations have the capacity to inflict major damage upon the other, drawing in elements from across the Middle East for a war that would turn very bloody very fast. Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, and Jordan all risk being drawn in directly, while the wealthy Gulf states and Turkey could be forced to take part too. Finally, there's the potential for a war to rapidly accelerate the nuclearization of Iran, where Tehran is believed to have the breakout capability to assemble multiple fission bombs in the span of weeks if it chose to do so. That would pit two nuclear-armed nations on either side of an active conflict and set off a regional arms race that could quickly draw in Saudi Arabia and Turkey as well. If you'd like to see a full-length episode or just what a war between Israel and Iran would look like, do let us know in the comments. We can oblige. In the coming weeks, the world will just have to wait and see what Israel will choose to do in response to this attack, and until that retaliation comes, it'll be impossible to pinpoint just how bad all of this is going to get. Hopefully, Israel and Iran will be able to commit a drawdown once the intense heat of this moment begins to cool, but that's not particularly likely, at least not right now. Will the Middle East see a full-scale war in 2024? We simply can't know for sure, and we can't even take a reasonable guess until a few more chess moves have played out in either direction. But is the region sitting on the brink? Yeah, absolutely. And for the sake of all people across the region, we hope that that reality changes very soon.